everybody. Uh, we're out today. We came to Battle Mountain, Nevada, and we're going to kind of show you around and show you what's here at Battle Mountain. And um, there's some interesting things here. Uh, the history of Battle Mountain is the population is about 3,635. It's primarily, its economic base is gold mining. There's a lot of gold mines up around the hills here. Um, this area was home to the Northern Paiutes and Shoshone people. Their area was noted for fur traders uh, back in the 1820s and 30s. And it served as a waypoint for the westward bound travel on the immigrant, immigrant trail um, along the Humboldt River by 1845. And according to legend, the name Battle Mountain comes from confrontations between the Native Americans and the early settlers during the 1850s and 60s. So I guess there was a, quite a few battles fought here and so hence the name Battle Mountain. Uh, when copper was discovered in 1866 and mining began, the Central Pacific Railroad started a station to support the uh, mining activity. And in 1870, the railroad moved to uh, Battle Mountain and established a town site to serve the copper and gold mining districts. And a few interesting notes here is President Ulysses S. Grant spoke in this town during his Western speaking tour. President Woodrow Wilson um, established Battle Mountain Indian Colony by executive order in 1917 which surprises me. I thought that would have been done earlier, but... And... Battle Mountain became the county seat in 1979. Um, in 2008, the Wells, Nevada earthquake uh, with a magnitude of 6.3 um, that affected most of the northeast part of the state severely damaged one of the city's oldest historical buildings, the Lemaire building, which was then had to be condemned. I guess it was a big historic building, uh, so it's sad to see it go. And true Nevadans know that all of the Silver State's small towns have something special to offer. They may not look like much to out-of-staters, but it's often the most unexpected places where you find the greatest adventures. And that's true, these small towns really have a lot to offer when you stop and actually go through them. And this couldn't be more true when it comes to Battle Mountain. So we're gonna spend the day here and see what's here and hopefully show you a little bit of history and some interesting items. So stay tuned. Okay guys, here's uh, some of the old buildings we found. This is, uh, this isn't Main Street, but it's like on the outskirts of town. So I kind of want to show you some of these. Let me walk down here on the sidewalk. This is kind of old part of town. The Owl Cafe right there is supposed to be a really super good place to eat. So we may have to stop in there later. An interesting note, there's really isn't much to this town, but we are on the outskirts, so. And that's the way we came in. Interesting note here is that when Battle Mountain was was uh, Battle Mountain was labeled the armpit of America in 2001 by the Washington Post. Uh, locals took the title in good stride. In fact, they embraced it. The nasty moniker was in reference to the town's lack of character and harsh location. The locals even hosted an annual festival in the pit sponsored by Old Spice Men's Cologne for some time and signs along I-80, the freeway, were decorated with the slogan, make us your pit stop. 
It just goes to show that Nevadans are a unique sort of people that aren't easily riled. Okay, we stopped here at the Battle Mountain Cookhouse Museum. So we're going to go in and take a look around. Uh, it was closed. There was a number on the door and the lady was kind enough to open it and let us in. So that was super. So we're going to go ahead and go in and see what kind of uh, mining equipment or relics they have here. So let's go check it out, guys. On the sidewalk, going up into, it's got all the people's names who apparently have donated to keep the museum open. So that's pretty cool. This is a cool little porch. They're setting up for artists today. I guess we have to sign in. So hold on, I'm going to sign in and be right back. Yeah, I'm going to school for pipeline in March. Oh. Huh. Look at this crochet bottle cover. How funny is that? See? Yeah, I guess we're going to start back here. I have a nice one for my hot water bottle, but I've never seen it on such a good bottle. I should have gone. You fell? I don't want that. We have a rather loud talker out there. Oh, there you go. Have some sarsaparilla. Look at these old telephones. Oh, there's an upstairs too. Look at these old school desks. These are cool. Check out these uh, oh, very cool. roller skates and ice skates. Those are so old. That's cool. That's a pretty old stove. Oh, and here's some really nice turquoise, Nevada turquoise. Suffragette meeting in Nevada took place in Babylon. Did it really? Yeah. Very neat. Gosh, this looks like garbage all right here. There was a lady here that just told me that Bruce Springsteen um, took this photo cover in Valmy, Nevada, which is just down the road from us from here in Battle Mountain and this is at the Battle Mountain Museum and she's hoping one day that uh, he might know that this cover is here and she'd love for him to stop by and maybe sign the cover that would be totally awesome so there you go guys Bruce Springsteen <laughs> okay. oh look at this old doll carriage <laughs> That's really cool. Believe it or not, folks, I learned to type on this exact type of typewriter in high school. We didn't have computers and stuff. I typed on this typewriter. Do you know that? What? I learned to type on that typewriter? Yes. In high school? I have a bottle in this case that's exactly like one I have. <laughs> that purplish one, and it was found in the desert. It's exactly. This is a dry washer used for in the process of mining or panning for gold. Lots of old bottles and jugs.
There's all pop bottles. That's pretty cool. And this is about the 1962 Battle Mountain Flood. Let's take a look. Wow. And this is downtown Battle Mountain. I don't know if you can see this. Look at that. I guess they really did get flooded. The Humboldt River must have really Those old cars. I love those old cars. Let's see if I can get this. Wow. Some of the pictures of the flood. It's a little bit of a glare on here. I don't know that you can see it very well. An interesting picture. Check out these typewriters. <laughs> these are so cool. It's a little disconcerting when they have antiques that I used when I was a kid. I learned to type on that typewriter right there in high school. Oh my goodness. And I was just saying it's a little disconcerting when you see things that I actually used and they're calling them antiques now. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now I feel like an antique. <laughs> look at the bright side. You're here. That's true. That's true. You're here. That's true. But I see things like that in old toys I used to play with, and I'm going, no, they can't be antiques yet. No, they can't. No. <laughs> That's hilarious. It's all perspective, huh? Exactly. That's pretty neat carving. Oh. Narrow gauge railroads. Very cool. Being an antique is not a bad thing because some people pay good money for antiques. That's true, so I'm worth a lot of money. That's right. I'm an expensive antique. <laughs> With a little polish in, I clean up real nice. That's right. You just need to be refurbished. I just need to be refurbished. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, look at all these arrowheads. That's cool. Early 1900s. This belonged to Chet and Dorothy Estes. Collected along the Reese River, Treaty Hill, Bateman Springs, Iron Point, and west of the railroad. Awesome. This is so 50s kitchen. <laughs> Old farmhouse 50s kitchen. Look at this stuff they got up there. Oh gosh, look at this old marshmallow box. Is that hilarious? This is so 50s kitchen. Except for the Keurig. But evidently they still use this. Look like at this old blender. It's so cool. Standard family size washboard. Carolina Washboard Company in Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh, here's my thing. I have, I'm a sucker for dishes. Check 
got this old stove, guys. Oh, look at this. 1950s tin, tin metal toaster. Look at these old spice boxes. That's a cool stove. the stairs to the second floor of this museum. We just had a really long, very informative talk with the lady that uh, is here at the museum and wish I could have put her on camera. She didn't want to. So you have to respect that. But look at this. I did not know this building was built with railroad ties. Check this out. We've ran into a lot of buildings that were railroad tie buildings. But this is cool. You can see the old cement in the cracks. That's really awesome. Okay, let's see what we have up here. Oh, look at these. Those are cool. They're insulators. Does he? You could often find them out in the desert. That's really neat. Oh, Molly. Hey. Oh. There's actually a fork. What have we got? Uh, whoa. What would you use a fork for with the. Oh, I don't even want to know. We don't want to know this. Okay, ladies, you might want to turn your heads on this one. This is medical instruments used in the 1870s for obstetrics and gynecology. Um, yeah, why is there a fork? <laughs> they use the fork to pull stuff out? What? We don't want to know. That's we don't it. want to know. No. Let's give it a oh, my goodness. These tools just give me the willies. No, thank you. Oh Holy crap. Gosh. That does. It actually uh, gives me butterflies. Oh. Thank God things have changed. Yes, indeed. Wow. Okay. It's made by a North There's North now that we got past the trauma of the medical equipment. <laughs> Here's some uh, Indian baskets. Look at these cradle boards for babies that the Native Americans used. Wow. These are grinding stones. This is from local Paiute and Shoshone tribes. That's pretty. That's really pretty. Oh, here's some really cool old cameras. Those are pretty neat. This here, ladies and gentlemen, right there is a movie projector, if you can believe it. That's amazing. Some old eyeglasses or spectacles, as I used to call them. Opera glasses. Premier Paris, 1930s, Mother of Pearl Opera Glasses. That's a nice looking saddle and some chaps. Built in 1924 for Johnny Jacks of Tonopah, Nevada. Wow, check out them shoes. Actually, I like those shoes. These are shoe cobbler forms. Late 1800s collection of cast iron shoe lasts.
meat market. Milk can. These are cool. These are from the Chinese section of town. Nevada Central Railroad. People working on the railroad. Oh, these old irons, those are amazing. Flat irons, heated in the fire or on the stove. And when they got hot, you'd iron your clothes. And when they started to cool down, you put them back on the stove. Um, like in my grandmother's time, she would have two of them. She would have one on the stove heating and use one and then switch them out when the one got cool. That way it didn't interrupt her ironing. This is where my house came from. Saddle. Look at that. That's beautiful. Now that had to be really fine tape. Look at these old rifles. The top four rifles were used during the Civil War. Wow. Top four were used in the Civil War. The next two were produced for the military. The last two rifles were known as guns that won the West. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a section. Oh, that's not the one for the military. It says it has hell carved on the handle. I thought that was interesting. Oh, yes, I just had that pointed out to me that, okay, the first four used during the Civil War. Uh, the fourth one down, if you can count them down, is a Spencer rifle. That was a repeating lever action. Um, the next two were for the military, the fifth and sixth guns down, and uh, they were produced with the word hell on the handle, carved into the handle. That's pretty interesting. And the last two are Winchester. Uh, the Seventh one is the Winchester repeating lever action. The eighth one is the Winchester 44 caliber lever action. They were found in the basement of the old grammar school here in Battle Mountain. And it's a mystery as to why they were there when they were actually found and who hid them. And uh, that's all they know on them right now. Pretty cool. Guys, we came to the Battle Mountain Cemetery um, it's on the list of cemeteries to visit in this area and said there's some older graves in here. So let's go in and take a look and uh, see if we can find some old pioneer graves. Okay, let's check out some of these graves we have here. Here's one, Wallace, Wallace Ray Hancock. He was born in 1893 and died in 1960. Wow. Oh, and this is so sad. You see these, see these, uh, you know somebody's there. The headstone is totally gone. Don't know who it is. Just the railings left. Here's some older. This cemetery is really kept up very nicely. Louis Chiara, July 16, 1932 is when he died and he was born in 1881. And this is the father. This is, 
I can't get over there and my phone doesn't want to zoom. Here we go. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, he was born in 1875, died in 1849. And right next door is Fanny Chiara, 1891 to 1977. Oh, these, look at these fences. These are so cool. I love these old fences. Here's some more of the Chiara family. Ermita, 1880-1908. Rosa, 1848-1921. And these were obviously family members. They're in the same enclosed area, but there's no headstone. And it looks like you can see right here, there was a plaque in there. And the plaque is now gone on both of these. That's too bad. And here's this fence. Let me back up here and let me just see these. These are so cool. You see a lot of these fenced areas on the old graves. Back in the day, it was like common practice to uh, do all the they fenced off all the graves, mostly for um, not so much grave robbers, but to keep animals out. That's a really ornate fence. That's so cool. I like that fence. There's another really nice fence here. This one I especially like. Let's see if we can get a well here's the headstone there's actually three in there but you can't read it oh it's you can't read it on camera but it says Edwin Gifford he was born in 1819 and that's as much as I can read on there um, this little one down here, I can't read the name, but he died on April 29th, 1878. This is a really nice headstone. I don't know if you can see it, the sun's shining the wrong way. John Blossom, 1836 to 1900, with Mary L, Earl M, and Ira S. Um, don't know if that's children or wife and children, and their dates aren't on there. But this plot is big enough that there are probably all four of them in here. And it's so nice that somebody brings flowers still. And a lot of these are simply numbers. As you can see these headstones here. See, they're just numbered. And this cemetery is just littered with just tons of markers that they're just numbers. Lots of them out there. You can see out there just stones with numbers on them. I would assume there is a registry because the graves are all numbered so that if you were looking for someone they probably know who they are from the numbers. So let's see if we can find some of the more older ones. Over here on a side note, uh, the lady at the museum recognized that I was an artist. And oh, this is sad. Here's another one that's fenced in. Okay. The fence was from Holbert and Company, St. Louis, Missouri. But it doesn't have a date. Let me see if I can find a date on the fence. No, it just says where the fence is from. I was wondering how old it is, but 
here again is really sad because someone's there, but there's no marker. Just a fence. But what I was saying, the lady at the museum recognized me from my art. And uh, she's going to contact me. She wants to do a show of my art. So that's pretty cool. That was exciting. She was a wealth of information on the history of this area too, but uh, she didn't want to be on camera, unfortunately. Really, really nice lady though. Here's Donald Andrew, 1872 to 1947, native of California. And William Fleming, 1947, 1870 to 1947, California. Donald Monroe, 1833 to 1906, native of Scotland. That's interesting. And these people were obviously father and sons from the, from the McDonald family. Hmm. From Scotland. Pretty cool. They were here before the state was even a state. Because, uh, 1833, wow, that was even before the big mining boom. They were here early. And here's the family of Moore. And they're all from Wow, 1904, clear back to 1880. Oh, Ferguson's and Moore's. Interesting. Wow. Andre Alano. He was born in 1888 and he died in 1981. Wow, he had a nice long life. Let's go ahead and take it this way. I'm not going to stop at the new one. Oh, this one's interesting right here. Joseph Martinelli. Born in 1892 and died in 1918. He was a native of Marlea, Lucia, Italy. And here's another one with a really, oh, this is beautiful. Really old, ornate fence. Really, really old. Let's see if we can read the headstone. It's an interesting headstone. Thomas Frizzini. He died in 1918, and he was 40 years old. And there's some more writing on the bottom, probably telling where he's from. But, gosh, the writing's almost gone on this thing. The weather is harsh out here, so... It's really difficult to keep the names. There's another one that I just cannot read. Oh, sadly, that one's broken. Here's another really old one. I'm get this one down here. And you'll notice, grass doesn't grow super well in the west. So all the cemeteries are gravel. I know a lot of the cemeteries back east are all grass. And these are all level. This is Mary Decker, 1834 to 1918. So she was here early too. Can you imagine the history these people have seen? Fred Veron, he was born in Canada in 1863, died in Battle, Battle Mountain, Nevada, 1930. 
Here's another Canadian. Hiram Barron. He died in 1906 at age 58. Okay, this is the Battle Mountain Grammar School um, that has turned into the courthouse. It was constructed in 1915, um, and the two-story brick building functioned as a grammar school from 1916 to 1923. It was solely as a grammar school for first grade through eighth graders into the 1960s. And then after changes in state policy in 1936, the school integrated and served Western Shoshone children alongside the white students in the community. In 1962, a flood damaged the schools in Battle Mountain and caused the grammar school to be closed and remain vacant into the 1970s. The school was repurposed as the Lander County Courthouse in 1979 when the county seat was moved to Battle Mountain. Hi hey everybody, I just wanted you to see this sign up here. This is Iron Point. This is on our way back from Battle Mountain. And the reason I stopped here is just a little side note. Um, James Reed stabbed a man named James Snyder. They were on the uh, California Trail in covered wagons going west. And they have to come through this area, which was part of the California Trail. And the reason that they got into a fight was one wagon passed another wagon, and the guy that he passed became angry, and they got into an argument, which turned into a fight, and uh, ended up with, uh, was it Mr. Reed that Mis got stabbed? Mr. Reed killed Mr. Snyder. Yeah, Mr. Reed killed a Mr. Snyder, and it was all because a covered wa his covered wagon passed the other covered wagon, and they took offense at that. But, you know, with all the hardships they had to endure, they were pretty cranky on that trail. I would imagine you're in a covered wagon, and it's hot, and it's icky, and tempers were real quick to flare. So this is the point where that happened, and it's sort of a infamous legend uh, along the California Trail. So I just thought I'd stop since I saw the Iron Point line, or the Iron Point sign, and uh, give you that little bit of a story. So that's it for this. Okay guys, this was um, our day out to Battle Mountain, and uh, we did get to see the things that I wanted to stop and see. And uh, there's some uh, trails up there that you can go up in the mountains to see some remnants of mining and uh, old ghost town remnants. But uh, we're going to have to save that for another day because it's been raining and the weather is really gross and uh, we don't want to go out there and get stuck right now because it's really mushy icky. So this is the end of this video. Thank you for watching and uh, have a good day, good morning, good evening, wherever you are and uh, we'll check with you later. Bye-bye.